All right, welcome everybody. So welcome to this uh, chat around what's the vision we are heading towards and also going to be a discussion about the roadmap and a lot about uh, what's happening in Java and what, what are the trends right now. So my name is Jona Lehtinen. Yeah, and I'm Leif. And we are broadcasting this from Turku, Finland. So it's a bit kind of a rainy weather over here. So it, <laughs> it's nice to be inside with this. But maybe we could start the uh, discussion, uh, or actually we could start with the poll. Yep. So let's see. Uh, so the question goes, just to kind of, uh, for us to understand a bit better how, how much you know about Vaadin. So how would you describe your experience with Vaadin? You should be seeing the poll right now, I guess. Yeah, it's lower right corner. Excellent. Most of you are... Well, we got 10 votes so far, so... Yeah, most of the 10 votes. <laughs> most of the 10 votes. <laughs> I've really experienced with Vaadin. That's great. That's great. And uh, please throughout the whole webinar, let's keep this a discussion. So ask questions, I will try to answer you right away if you know the answer. But, uh, yep. <laughs> that's another question. Yep. So right now we see that around 60% actually have building multiple applications with Vaadin already. There's a handful of people who are completely new to Vaadin and still eager to, to hear about how we see the world of, of web app development. Yeah, but it looks like 80% like of you have been building projects with Vaadin. So that's that's a lot. Yeah. All right. So let's jump forward. And we could actually start discussing the versions a bit, what we have, because we are having so many parallel versions. Yep. So in total, we got nine active version branches that we're maintaining. So it's kind of, it's the latest versions, then a couple of of kind of not the latest, but still re really new versions that are maintained still. And then also a long range of, of older versions that have extended maintenance and so on. And, and the point really is that we care about keeping things running for a long time. But at the same time, we're adding lots of new features always to the latest versions. So I guess it's about having the pain somewhere. So either, rather, <laughs> either it's on your side where you have the kind of uh, worry about versions not working or it's on our side for maintaining so many parallel versions. Yep. Yeah. So the engineering team thinks that maintaining nine versions, that's way too much, but at the same time, kind of, it makes it easier also for us because we don't have to be so, so kind of careful with, with how we do things for the latest version. So what's going on right now? Uh, right now, uh, we are uh, working on a couple of different things in parallel. So for Flow, just a whole bunch of smaller improvements based on basically what, what all of you have, have prioritized on GitHub. So every, every time... Like paper cuts in a way. Paper cuts, yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's a long, long list of what the team has been, been doing already. For Hilla, we're working on Autogrid. So, uh, no, Autocrud, I mean. <laughs> Close by. <laughs> yeah, we, we just completed the Autogrid and now it's Autocrud. So it, it's about making it... So really we have good. different naming for that. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, that, that's the working name at least. Yeah. Uh, so that's about making it really easy to create CRUD views based on your Java types with, with Hilla, so TypeScript uh, uh, UI there. So Could try it out. Uh, and give us feedback because we know that there are some gaps and it's, it's really hard to see the gaps in real world applications if you haven't been trying that out and given, given us feedback. Yep. Uh, for the components, so this is something that is useful for both the Hilla users and the Flow users. We're making it easy to, to style things, easier to target where different styles are applied and so on. So adding custom CSS properties, adding new ways of setting class names to different parts and, uh, and those kinds of things. Finally, there's uh, the AppSec kit that we just recently launched for Vardin 8 and Vardin 24. We are now also backporting that to, to Vardin 14 and Vardin 23. All right, and we'll have that all out by December, right? Yep, middle of December is, is, is the next platform release train. So then all of these things and a whole bunch of smaller fixes and enhancements will be out. Yeah, so we want to spend most of the time just about uh, where we might be going in the future rather than where we are right now. So let's take a bit kind of a longer view in this. And when taking a longer view, uh, I think it's kind of good to uh, maybe touch where we are coming from first, just briefly. So the very 
background for Vardin was uh, starting from like 98-ish. Uh, when I was part of a project where we built, uh, I guess, first virtual hospital system in Europe. And that has nothing to do with Vardin, but kind of set the scene on need for this kind of uh, componentization, not kind of building everything from scratch, but having reusable components for login and uh, content management and translations and menu and so forth. So that was the kind of a background that we started at. And then we started a new company around this idea that maybe we could have these like reusable Lego blocks. And from that, we actually started designing this picture is coming from 2001, I believe. So that was from the first 001 version of Vardin. It was called Millstone back then. Um, so I believe that we were probably one of the first, if not the first web framework that introduced the idea of component oriented, uh, completely kind of component oriented here are like component trees and, and rendering the websites like that. Yeah, so I, I guess that was at that time kind of the way you built desktop applications. Yeah, that was the way from there. Yeah, on, on the web, it was completely kind of weird idea. Yeah, we wanted to kind of a, basically implement a Delphi in web. Yeah. And we started by implementing that in Perl. It didn't really work out. So we kind of switched over to Java, luckily, and started with, with that quite like late 2000. Uh, so the UIA over here is means like user interface automata. So it was a bit academic. So meaning UI component. And we had also purchased a layer in there, like a kind of a Hibernate that was kind of built into Vardin. Yeah. So this was before Hibernate existed. I guess or maybe. 10 years at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and on top of that, we have like rendering pipeline. We call them skins, but it's like theming in, in there. So we had kind of uh, all of this in a cluster environment somewhere around 2001. And then we re-implemented it from scratch uh, 2002. And then we implemented it again from scratch in 2002. And we ended up with the uh, in 3.0.0. So it was called 003. And then I thought that hmm, nobody's going to be using 003. So we kind of uh, turned the numbers around. It was a bit of a fake thing. Windows 3 was kind of <laughs> the first working version back then. Anyways, then we started adding support for like different kind of uh, terminals, including mobile. And we released that as an open source in 2002, December. Uh, but I kind of think that the key thing that I wanted to say about this is that it was always around making it easy to develop business web apps. So kind of exactly the same thing that we are doing today. And uh, we also chose two really, really good ways of doing that. So first of building on top of Java platform, it has been stable since that. And also hiding the complexity, basically abstracting away from like divs and browser bugs and communication and so forth with uh, commoditization. Yep. So uh, I guess uh, if you're wondering what the heck is this Vardin Create, we <laughs> are reusing the slides from a uh, customer conference we had last week in, in Frankfurt. So it was wonderful to have like, uh, I think they have over 100 or 90, no, 90 something, 90 something people all around the world from like US and Brazil and all the European countries flying in, in one, one place. And we had a two days, two wonderful days of uh, presentations and round tables and discussions. So we are just kind of reusing uh, slides from there. We actually are arranging that next year as well. So if you're interested in joining, <laughs> uh, keep that in mind. All right, trends. Uh, the question goes, is Java really stable? It's like used by 30% of the developers. So this is coming from Stack Overflow surveys. Um, and what I'm seeing is that I actually went back and took manually all the Stack Overflow surveys that were available. This is like seven years of data. And it looks like the share of Java uh, developers out of all developers is decreasing. So it's kind of a scary picture. Yeah, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the other side of the picture is that the number of developers, total number of developers in the world is, is increasing. So we have 28 million-ish developers in the world. So if you do the multiplication, we end up with 9 million Java developers. And then I kind of scratch my head that I have heard this number 9 million before. And lo and behold, uh, Java 1 advertised in 2012 to have 9 million Java developers. So it looks like it's actually quite stable that 
uh, market share is decreasing, but the total number seems to be staying staying stable. Maybe more interestingly, the web landscape is, is changing a has been changing a lot. So nowadays, uh, React is extremely popular. 12 million developers using React. Angular, maybe 6 million. And uh, the kind of uh, the most relevant for us is uh, Spring. And I mean, I don't know why, why the Spring Boot would be like a web framework category, but nevertheless, that's kind of uh, uh, where, it, where it is uh, in the Stack Overflow survey. So it's 4 million developers. Uh, yeah, I mean, Spring Boot is used for building web application, even though you maybe not build the web part of it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But yeah, it, it is what it is. So uh, React is popular and 4 million developers building on top of Spring Boot. That's actually quite a bit of people. Yeah. So um, uh, with that, uh, we have another poll that we'd like to run uh, because I was asking this question somewhere else. So how would you describe your... No. Oh, sorry, no, not this one. <laughs> no, wait. Where, where is our poll? Over there. Oh, as, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. As a Java developer, how do you write web apps? I mean, this is probably kind of a biased audience. Um, so the option being mostly in server side Java, or you would be writing mostly in React, Angular, Vue, whatever front-end framework. Or you have a front-end developer in your team who is doing most of that. Or you have a completely different team who does the front-end for you. So let's see what we get from there. Yeah, it's kind of a <laughs> biased as I expected. <laughs> yep. So some reason. People who go to volume webinars also yeah. use server side Java for their UI. Uh, we just kind of wanted to see how much bias this is compared to compared to Spring audience. Uh, I, I guess this is kind of a table stack. Seventy five percent ish of you are mostly writing UIs, so mostly writing web apps in the server side Java. So no surprise in, in there. Yep. Except that there is fourteen percent who are using React or Angular Vue, some kind of front end framework. Or maybe we should count those together. Twenty-ish percent of people have uh, basically your team is using front-end framework to write the web app. Yeah. So we did ask this from uh, in LinkedIn group uh, around spring. So there are three hundred thousand people in that group, and uh, we got uh, out of the, out of there we got uh, 1600 answers and it looks a bit different compared to, to this obviously but to my surprise it was just 10% of those who had a separate front end team and the rest 90% was like uh, split evenly between either server side java or then front end frameworks yeah i mean you you posed the same question to me also before doing that poll and i guess that there would be much more or much bigger percentage using React or Angular or something, and also much bigger percentage having a front-end team so that they would only build the kind of microservice or something. But but yeah, this is really interesting. Yeah, and then the cool thing, the reason why we're super interested in this is that uh, obviously one flow is a pretty awesome fit to the service of Java landscape. I, I, I believe that uh, unfortunately it's, it's kind of small share of this. There are so many people who are just writing, I don't know, JSPs or yeah, th th time leaf for instance is also very popular. Something like that. Uh, but Hill is actually a pretty good fit for the audience who wants to use React together with the backend. So that was kind of a nice uh, to see the picture that we can help maybe ninety percent of this audience. Yeah. So uh, going to the architecture side. Yep. So I mean. When you build a web application, you, you typically you have this kind of traditional setup. Well, yeah, there's some backend storage, and then there's some some way of accessing that, and then you got a network, and then you got kind of the actual UI logic in the state, and then finally there's kind of the the user interface with the components and so on. And I mean, you got that with Timely, if you got that with Angular and React, and every so app is looking the same. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at the same time, I mean. Now I lost my train of thought. Maybe just go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, when you lay out a typical web uh, uh, framework on top of this, you have a separate framework for the back end. You have some kind of a communication layer like GraphQL or REST or something like that. Uh, I mean, it's not necessarily any code, but it's more like you have to design that and figure out how you are doing that. 
between the front end and the back end. Then you have a front end framework like React or Angular or something like that. Some people also on top of that want to use some kind of component library that they can use ready-made reusable components. And then some developers say that, hey, I can write all the components myself. So I'm not in that camp, but it's, I understand that many people want to do that as well. Yeah, but that's what typical web application development works like, but kind of we think there's a better way. Uh, we think there's this way with, with kind of having all this spanning kind of from the back end all the way onto the UI logic. That can be just a single framework. So that's that's how we build Flow, basically. Yeah, always when kind of uh, discussing with customers, I kind of end up hearing that, hey, I'm a backend Java developer, and with Vardin, I was able to expand my reads to front end as well. So it's kind of a, they feel that they come from one direction, and then they are able to expand what they can do. Yeah. So, I mean, this is clearly coming from the back end towards the front end. Yeah, though I've also been hear hearing kind of the opposite that we used to use React Angular or something, but it was it wasn't productive for us because we we had kind of there were so many extra layers to take take care of different people in the team needed to coordinate and so on. So so there's there's many reasons there. So I don't think that we need to jump into code. Basically, what do you guys are coding with Flow anyway? So it's basically just you put all the code in one place. So that's thing yep. to remember in here. So with that, we introduce Hilla, and that kind of uh, allows you to uh, use front-end framework in a seamless fashion with the back-end Java. So we kind of take care of all the network communications. It automatically creates a TypeScript-based uh, uh, APIs for you on the client side. So you, have to, you don't have to figure that out. So if you have a just data model of the service of Java, it generates that for you automatically on the client side. And with that, you can take care of the network layer. And if you like React, then you can use that on the client side. And you still have the same component set as, as uh, you have it flow. Uh, so if you look at that from the core perspective, yep. it basically gonna end up having two files. Yep, so so that's the, that's the benefit in one way, because then you can really use React, which is it's kind of closer to the front end, but at the same time, you need to split things up between Java and TypeScript between between those two different worlds. So, but it's also got a downside. Yeah. Clearly, Flow, if you kind of just compare, this Flow is more productive. You only write one thing. You got everything in one thing. You just got one abstraction layer. Yeah, and and where the React actually shines is that when you want to customize the nitty gritty of the user interface if you care about what type of elements there are what exactly happens when you click uh, click list and are in, in there then you have a bit more control over that actually we could have walked through this code example because i, I think most of you are using flow not hill it's actually going to give an example yeah uh so on the server side you just have any spring service in there you just annotate every service and it's published but we have this annotation browser callable that basically takes this one step further it, it auto generates all those uh, kind of a, the, the data model and the service layer on the client side in typescript and when it's in typescript it's it's typed so when you write react on the client side it can auto complete all of that you can check whether the types are okay so you get many of the benefits uh, that you are used in in java yeah, so you, you get compilation errors. If you have changed some name on the Java side, you get compilation errors in TypeScript. If, if you didn't remember to change it there, you get auto completion in the TypeScript editor that, oh, this property name is available on this type and all those kind of things that you expect. So for example, in this case, if you look at the code over there, we can say uh, use date uh, customer. This customer has been already auto generated based on the server side Java definition of what customer should entail. Um, also, get customer over here in the service. The customer service has been auto generated, so we can go there and ask it to give us a, a customer. So that type of things are totally automated. So you don't have to do any REST calls yourself. You don't have to figure out what's in JSON uh, that you get back from the REST. You don't have, you know what is in, in that because it's typed and so forth. It's super handy. Yep. But still, it's, it's two different languages. It's two different languages. So something cool happened last week uh, around Next.js. Uh, so as you mentioned, some people want to come from the React side and then expand to the server side. I think 
Next.js is probably the best framework for, for a front-end uh, developer to expand the reach towards the server side, while we're coming up for the best for back-end developers reaching towards the client side. So they uh, implemented an idea where you can uh, inject server code inside TypeScript, inside React. So this is, it's a bit kind of strange notation. Like you, you say, use server here. So this is a front-end React code, and you can basically annotate it with the string with the string over there. Say use server, and this part, this await part, this actually runs on the server and automates the communication in there. Kind of the same idea that we have in Hill, but coming from different direction. Yeah, I would say it's even the same idea that you have in Flow, because here we have a button that has a click listener yeah. that, run, that can kind of direct access the back end. So it's kind of reverse flow. It's reverse flow, definitely. Flows up. No, <laughs> let's not go there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So anyways, if you put this all the, in, in the map, uh, it's kind of a, becomes obvious that when you have this uh, bunch of different technologies approach, backend, REST, React, whatever components, basically different technologies in different layers that supports the team or organization where we have back end and the front end team separately. It's, it's pretty good for that. But at the same time, if you have only one team who owns the whole thing end to end, like the full stack team, it, it kind of introduces a lot of complexity in, in that for, for no reason. Yeah. So uh, if you have a full stack team, it might be better to actually use some full stack framework, like in this case, um, Next.js, if you are coming from the front-end side or if you're coming from the Java side, either of what in Flow or what in Hilla, depending on whether you want to be more productive, Flow, or if you want to be uh, having more control over the user experience and maybe utilize React development law process as well in, in, the, in your team. So then it would be Hilla. Uh, yeah. Actually, one kind of the, this is more like a philosophical thing about the full stack teams that the, I found powerful is that when you have a team who is really empowered to own something completely, so they own the solution, they own how they solve it, they own, they understand the problem, and they are kind of capable of, of uh, uh, solving that, they are so much faster compared to not owning that. And I believe that only full stack team can own the whole solution because if it's uh, like, Two different teams, front and the back end, they end up kind of throwing tickets over the wall, writing in Jira that, hey, could you have this kind of API that I could call? And then the other team says that, yeah, we are in the middle of the sprint. Let's see the next sprint. And it kind of slows everything down a lot. Yeah. Uh, one thing that people keep asking kind of is, but we, we got so, such a big application. We, we can't just have everyone in one team because that's too much communication overhead. But the trick there is to kind of slice things up by the business domain so different parts of the application owned by different full stack teams instead of having it so that that you got kind of slice it up by the by the technology because i mean then you also just can have kind of two or three teams maybe but no way of getting to 10 teams if yeah. you get a really big application hey uh regarding Hilo, we got a question from rene so are there any future plans for front end part of the hill lab being deployed independently of the back end part for example on the cdn uh Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing... That's a bad answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, the thing here is that that kind of encourage you to have separate teams working on it and so on. It kind of encourage you to to optimize for for make, making the making things more complicated. And the question really is kind of what are the benefits? And and so far, we are not convinced enough that there are enough benefits when you got a single team. I mean, one big thing with Hilla also is that you deploy the front end and the back end at the same time together, because otherwise you always have to do lots of API versioning to keep keep it so that even if, if the front end isn't updated, it talks with a newer up version of the server, they can still stay in sync and so on. So, so far we, we have kind of avoided falling into that trap, but we might still do it at some point. Yeah. Uh, another question from Bori. I don't know, Bori Boy, Bori Boy. Hopefully, I'm not kind of uh, butchering the name uh, around the uh, big decimal fields. I think this goes such uh, kind of deeply into specifics. That it's better that you file a bug ticket about this. Yeah, or, or ask on Discord, for instance. Uh, also, yeah. 
But uh, anyways, if you put the ticket in there and if it's not really a bug, you'll get the comment anyway. So yeah. Um, all right. So let's move forward. Full stack components. Yep. Um, who should talk about full stack components? It's a full stack. We should kind of both talk. Oh at the yeah, same time. <laughs> that's an excellent idea. Yeah. No. So uh, we have a, we have, and you have used body components for a long time, and we kind of take a lot of pride in in how they look and how we have crafted them. And we, th there are a lot of them. They have a lot of features. We kind of feel that it's uh, it they. In order to, to build a great user experience in for, for your application, it has to kind of have this all ABC accessible, being beautiful, being consistent. And it's freaking hard to do if you're building that on a foundation where the components are not accessible, beautiful, and, and, and consistent. So that's have been our focus this far, uh, building set of Lego blocks that you can use to build your application and making it a bit easier for you to build uh, ABC type of uh, great uh, ABC type of user experiences. But these are kind of, uh, if you look at this in this architectural picture, they are kind of small pieces on the front end. They are individual UI components. So now we're kind of thinking, uh, could we build something that would capture more value for you? And that kind of goes back to the foundation, the, the Atula and the virtual hospital story. So over there, our aspiration was not to build reusable date pickers and buttons and grids. It was more around, could we build user management? Could we build internalization? Could we build like everything regarding security? Could we build this and that and, and have this as a components that, that we could use to build the application out of kind of a larger building blocks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm about to say doubles, but <laughs> in one way, a flow component is already full stack in the sense that it's got a server side part and a client side part, but we're actually thinking of kind of even bigger, also kind of getting directly to the persistence. So maybe yeah. you want to plug it in, use your own persistence, but still that the component itself basically covers a whole use case, not just one small building block of that use case. So for example, could it be a user manager, all the kind of uh, that user manager entails? Uh, browsing number of users, setting permissions to them, and so forth. And if you could have many of these blocks, would it be how much faster could we make you if you can in your next application you could take these larger blocks and build all the kind of uh, boring parts that are not really kind of related to your application but need to be in there and, and just kind of build it out of a Duplo blocks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people hate this analogy of Duplos and Legos because Duplos are a bit dumb, but yeah and, and they are not very flexible uh, all right fair enough fair enough so um anyways if you could build this uh, out of larger blocks that are flexible and smart yes and maybe transparent as well so that you can maybe see and modify things a bit if, if you don't like how they are built i'm quite sure you're stretching the analogy too far yeah, yeah i know <laughs> so um the, th this is what we are looking at the moment could we build a set of full stack components that would be useful for you. And actually we need your help in that. What are those Duplo blocks? Ah, I made it again. Yes. Yeah. Those full stack components. Yes. Um, so we kind of noticed that we have one unique thing in Vardin compared to most of the frameworks out there. We are quite opinionated what's on the server side and on the client side. So when we are kind of uh, coupling already the, the back end and the front end together, uh, we should be in a position where we are able to really uh, make these full stack components possible. In If you can compare that to those uh, frameworks where it's a different product on different layers, they cannot coordinate that well together. Like in Vardin, I think one of the, a couple of examples that we have had this far, like a spreadsheet component, it kind of goes end to end. It has all the calculation logic on the server side and it that kind of shows things on the client side. It's, it's really hard to do on a front-end framework or lazy loading data grids. That's another example. But maybe you could kind of go even further with this and start shipping larger pieces. Yeah. Uh, the kind of funny thing is that this is not a new idea. There are a lot of low-code 
platforms out there that basically are living out of this idea. I'm not a fan of local platforms, but it's kind of cool to see that somebody has validated this is something that people actually can use and they are quite productive with, with this idea. And we also already shipped one uh, really interesting full, full stack component. It's kind of a, it doesn't look like a full stack component, but it is, uh, so the collaboration when we have control over all the layers, you can quite handily build uh, real-time collaboration in your applications in this. Um, so some of these components, these full stack components, they can be more like an infrastructure pieces rather than the visible components. So overall, this is something that our team is thinking about a lot, what we are putting a lot of effort next year. And my question goes, what should those components be? So if you have any ideas, reach out. If you have any kind of a thoughts, what would be useful for your next project, please tell us. And I mean, the, <laughs> the picture is a, a intentionally vague. So I took one of our, our idealists and fed that to Dali tree, and it came up with this kind of garbage that kind of shows a bit around the lines that we are thinking. There are some keywords there. Some keywords, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's they, not there. Yeah. So intentionally kind of obfuscated. But hopefully you get some ideas from there as, as well and uh, on what type of things this could be. Yep. Should we look at the questions here in between since we're going to the next, yes. next idea? So we got Dominic asking that if you look at the web page, it seems like Vardin is kind of working best with, with Spring Framework. And, and then the question is that how about something like Quarkus? So um, I can take this one. Yep. So uh, I think it was 70 to 80% of, of the Vardin user at the moment, they are using Spring. So it's super popular among the Vardin users. And when you look at the whole market, um, I recall the math was that if you just look at the um, Spring, uh, professional developers building on top of Spring, that's roughly like 4 million. And at the same time, professional developers building on top of Quarkus, that would be like 300K, 400K. So, so like 10x difference in, in there. So, I mean, Quarkus is awesome for, for sure. We'll keep supporting Quarkus in, in Flow for sure. But I, I think uh, it, it, uh, Spring is a pretty easy choice because it's so popular. And that way we are, it's easy choice for us as well to invest more. On, on top of Spring. So where we can support both, great. But sometimes uh, it makes sense for us to choose, for example, in some full stack components to make a better support or support first for one. And in that case, that would be Spring. Yep. Then we got Gutterm commenting about the CDN that might make sense if you have a uh, kind of a enterprise applications built, built by, by multiple uh, war, war files. Uh, and then, then kind of the duplicate Vardin libraries could be loaded from one place in the CDN instead of kind mm -hmm. of each time for, for each individual application. So mm, that that's kind of how it can work with Flow. But in Hilla, since you got actually the business logic also embedded together there, it might be a bit complicated because how do you know which UI component should actually be on that CDN deployed thing and so on? So it's it, there might be a case, but it, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, Rene is asking about it, would there be improved support for Kotlin and Hilla in the, in the near future? Uh, I guess mm. the fair answer is not. Really. Not, not in the near future, no. Uh, shout out to Martin Wüsner. He's been awesome in, in uh, promoting Kotlin support around Flow. And I hope that we are able to, to have more specific Kotlin support somewhere in the future for Hilla as well. I love the language. But right now, nothing planned. We have, the, there are such a kind of a core functionalities that we want to build first in Hilla. And it makes sense to build those first for Java. Yeah, so we want to nail the Hilla development experience for one platform first. And then once that is in Scale. place, yeah. W once that is in place, then we can expand. Yeah. We got SC asking, will there be a moment when a flow version would stabilize and support a decent amount of add-ons because uh, SC hates it when when there's a new release and then add-ons are not compatible. So basically, SC wants us to stop 
improve in flow. Um, so would it mean that it will be good to kind of stay on LTS or? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to use the latest version. And yeah, usually it takes a while, usually a couple of months or so before add-ons have caught up. So at the same time, this is where the dilemma kind of, should we make improvements or should we keep things stable? And, and the solution really is kind of, there are those old versions, they are stable, but they don't get the improvements. And the add-ons themselves, um, if, if you are referring to add-on directory, they are to, built by uh, third parties, people who are ent enthusiastic about Vaadi and what's going to publish their work. So it's up to them to publish to whichever version they, they like and at the pace that they like. It's They are free anyway. So Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of more questions. Should we maybe go through a little bit of the content first so that we don't forget about it? We had some content. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do that and come back to questions a bit later on. Um, so uh, one of the things that many of you have been asking is, uh, could we have a better visual editor? So how do I edit visually? And if you look back to Varden Designer, uh, it kind of follows this model where we have a model of the user interface stored somewhere. It's not in code, but it's in this case, it's uh, like the co uh, web component, component tree that is serialized in HTML file. It's not really HTML, but it, it looks like an HTML file. And uh, then you can drag and drop things around. You can change properties in this. And this is kind of typical experience for a visual designer, kind of a bit complicated. You can, uh, for a simple case, you can draw your user experience or user interface with that. A bit more complicated case, you're gonna bump to some corner cases and then you have to pretty much kind of rewrite it because you, there are too many limitations. Uh, so it's kind of a, people love how easy to get started and that they hate it after it kind of bites them in the ass when they kind of bump to those limitations. Um, Apple, I, I think, has been the, the pioneer and the best of everybody when it comes to uh, UI editors. They started with Next Step and had this uh, UI builder in there that they kind of got to Xcode and so forth. And it followed the same model up until it didn't. So a few years back, they kind of did the whole model. They thought that, oh, we have to restart the whole thing. And what they did, they got back to basics. Let's code and see, see the outcome live next to the code. So let the code be the master what defines the UI instead of be having a separate model that is somehow bound to the code. And this is a pretty powerful model. So this is like a web-oriented model. You code, you reference the web page or the web page references itself and you see the outcome right away. So we love this model. So we started going after this ourselves. Basically, you code and you see the outcome right away. And, and here we're actually asking the next question in, in the queue. So Bobby asked, is hot loading supported when using Vardin with Spring Boot while developing IntelliJ? So yes, it, yes. Is, it, it is supported. It's, it's not instant, 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 like you have with React kind of the exact same moment. But uh, if you're also using JRebel or Hotswap agent, then it just needs to reload the page whenever you save a change. Uh, you just need to actually configure IntelliJ to actually compile every time you save, because by default, it, it does that only when yeah. you hit the build button. Like in this case, I'm going to be nail them, so I actually had to save. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you use uh, JRebel or Hotswap agent, then it's really instant. If you use nothing special, then it takes a couple of seconds for it to, to deploy the new version, but it, it's still really smooth. Yeah, but this is just code. So in a way, it's not really visual design. It's, it doesn't help you. It, I mean, there is autocomplete, so that kind of helps, but it doesn't give you like uh, any idea what type of components are there. So what we build with uh, Varin, uh, startwide.com is increasing amount of ways to design your application in, in the beginning of the of your development cycle so you can add different kind of views in in there and uh, with that you can also see how they look in code you can maybe change the theme a bit and in the end of it let's see if i actually have a live demo there mm -hmm. probably... oh <laughs> Uh, not there, just a second, from there. Yeah. So you can also now 
build your UI by drag and dropping in there. So you have a component palette, you can drag and drop different kind of components in there, you can rearrange them, you can change the properties a bit. So kind of a typical uh, visual design experience. Uh, but this is only for the starting of your project. So it's, it's cool for building a prototype, but it's not really useful for writing your code uh, for kind of a during your project. Maybe you could kind of cut and paste the code to your browser, but it's still kind of a hack, a workaround. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a little bit inconvenient. So what we'd like to do uh, and where we would like to go from here is uh, basically... Can I get the next? Basically enable the same visual editing while having your code still being the master model for the UI. So we'll be bringing um, incrementally some of these drag and drop tooling inside your application. So basically inside Vardin Debug uh, DevTools uh, window, the, the kind of Vardin logo in the bottom uh, right corner of the application. Clicking that will then kind of enable some of those editing functionalities, both for theming as well as layouts. Yeah. And uh, it might be a bit more limiting than at than the traditional uh, drag and drop layout because we want it to be robust because it edits your code so it might break the project. Um, but we also kind of went a bit further than that. So the next thing is, is purely a prototype. So the vision in, in here is that could we have a like a AI powered Vardin designer sitting next to you when you are coding. So if I'm coding here, Ovi, uh, maybe I don't want to, you will have, have you over there, maybe Yoni would be the better one for yeah. actually kind of yeah. showing how to make it beautiful and and uh, how to kind of uh, build the layouts in there. So the prototype over here is actually called uh, Yoni, like Yoni AI. Um, and this is uh, just a kind of really, really early prototype on, on this. But what we can do is, uh, started asking Yoni questions that, hey, please, could you add a button over here? So uh, what Yoni does, he actually codes for me, modifies my code live, adds that button, and actually he made an error. So we can ask that, hey, could you actually have that co button call different function in there so that it's uh, it would be working? And because this is real live code, it actually works. So I can use this application while Yoni is changing it uh, and you can start asking questions like, please rearrange these components, please bring in a template. Could you maybe bind that to a data source? So you can do a lot of things. And we want to kind of bring this as well next to the layout editor so that they form a new type of UI editing experience where you can use the power of uh, large language models, but also you can draw with the mouse and see the, both of the results at the same time. Or even edit the code. Or even in the code. Yeah, I mean, because just your own AI on its own is quite limited, just drag and drop on its own is quite limited. But then when you get all of the three together and kind of pick the one that is most appropriate for, for each case, that's the really, really power of it. So another cool prototype, this is uh, even more prototype, I guess. So one of the cases where Vari used quite a bit uh, is uh, modernization. You have let's say old swing application and you want to bring that to uh, Vardin flow, rewrite that in Vardin flow. And it's kind of a start to be repetitive and you have many, many views. And sometimes you don't even have the implementation of that. So what if we could instead go and take a screenshot of that old application and then we could maybe kind of find which part of the application we want to code. We send those pixels over to a, to a model and the model recognizes what components are there, where they are, what text is there and creates the UI for us. In this case, it's a flow based UI that it, it created over there. And uh, it's pretty good with uh, swing like user interfaces because that we used what we used for for training the model. But the downside is that it doesn't really fully understand anything uh, behind the behind the scenes. So it doesn't understand any logic for this. So this is uh, something we are working on, kind of bringing AI to be part of Vardin UI editing experience. Uh, we want to bring 
make it possible for you to uh, use uh, ready-made UI templates, have AI integrate those to your code, um, have the AI read your database or data model and generate any kind of uh, uh, forms that you need based on that data description, maybe build a mock data for your test cases, help legacy, in legacy modernization, maybe from pixel to, to code, pixels to code, or maybe from code to code as well. That's another model that we are working on at the moment. So a lot of uh, exciting areas in, in there. Um, should we go to questions before? We can take a couple of questions, definitely. Uh, Dominic asks, is Vardin Flow suited for large-scale SaaS applications? Absolutely. So there is the kind of misconception that Vardin Flow wouldn't be scaling the large number of users. Uh, when our team has been looking many, many cases where there are scalability problems, almost always it's, it's that they have, uh, somebody has kind of a, uh, as something too complicated from Hibernate and Hibernate builds this really complicated query and that kind of uh, slows down the whole system. So that's the most typical performance problem. It's, it has nothing to do with Vardin, yeah. database being slow. The uh, other concern is kind of using lots of memory on the server and yeah, it uses more than some other solutions, but at the same time with a typical application, I actually did the math with uh, Amazon EC2 instances of, uh, a couple of weeks ago and it turns out that basically for each hundred users you have you pay one dollar per month to get the amount of memory you need so if you have ten thousand users that's still just a hundred bucks per and month that's so, concurrent users yeah concurrent users yes yeah. so, and, and that's still i mean hundred bucks bucks per month is is not much for hosting a SaaS application so if you have a uh, hundred thousand co paying customers that they're using it one hour a day, roughly speaking, you end up paying like 100 bucks a month for hosting costs. Yeah. And obviously it scales up because you can rent as many servers as you want. So oh, of course that's the hosting cost for the actual kind of application server. Then you have databases yeah. and so on also, but that's Fair something enough. you have regardless. That, 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 that you have always. And I mean, hosting um, even like a fully front end solution that costs something as well. And then you might have like, a, uh, even more calls to the back end. So it, it's not that kind of <coughs> black and white, uh, which one is cheaper to host. But I think the right answer is that it's the, the hosting of the UI layer is kind of irrelevant of the cost anyway. So it's the hosting costs are, are kind of accumulated somewhere else. Now it is mostly running <laughs> ML models. That's the kind of a <laughs> real cost in, in there. Yep. Then we got Rene asking, could you please give a little preview of the Hiller roadmap? Actually, for the previous, there is a pretty good uh, blog okay. post about uh, the scalability by, I think it was written by Matti Tahonen. Yeah, he, he wrote it a couple of months ago. Yeah, so you can find it from one blog. So it, it kind of actually does the math and uh, shows some benchmarks, how Matti measured, how much memory is consumed. So it kind of uh, gives you some numbers on, on that as well. You don't have to trust late. You can, <laughs> you can trust Matti yeah. or run the benchmark yourself. Yeah. Anyways, next question was Rene who asked, uh, could you give a preview of the next milestones on the Hiller roadmap? So like mentioned, the immediate thing that we're already developing, that's the auto CRUD for, for creating CRUDs based on, on Java types. Then beyond that, we haven't really decided exactly what's next. Overall, the theme is to keep improving kind of the base experience. So we have been talking about making it easy to do interna internationalization, making it easy to do error handling, making it easy to, um, to well, may maybe those are quite two, two good examples, but we haven't decided in which order and so on. So we try to do kind of a, what we try to do is build reference applications and learn where are the gaps in the developer experience and kind of address those gaps. Yeah, a bit more agile way of rather than kind of a knowing all the milestones upfront. One kind of big theme that we have in the horizon is uh, that we want to bring Hilla and Flow closer to, to each other so that you would be able to have Hilla views in Flow application and, and vice versa. So that they, they could be like seamless um, parts of the of the same body platform. Yeah. And one more big theme also is 
uh, like, like this mentioned, these full stack components, they would also be kind of collaborative. Uh, and we, we also want to make it uh, really easy to, to b make collaborative kind of basically sharing parts of the UI state between multiple users in Hill. So, so that's, that's maybe the third kind of big picture thing that we will be doing quite soon, we think, but, but right now we're just focusing on the autocrad for, for the rest of this year. Yeah, well, it's actually pretty powerful. And when you kind of see in multiple users using the same data behind the scenes and one person changing something on the UI and it changes immediately on the other person's UI as well, without you actually having to code that, it's, it's super cool. Yep. Then we got Olaf asking about a full stack components uh, and kind of how to integrate with the backend spring services and so on. Uh, he actually suggests exactly what we are thinking. So there should be interfaces that you can implement to integrate with your backend. At the same time, we also provide a default implementation that just uses spring data JPA to to kind of do everything automatically. But when you want to customize that, you just implement those interfaces your, yourself, and then you can you can integrate it however you want with the backend. So the key is that whatever, whatever you use for storing your data, the full stack component should be able to store the data in the same place. So that it's not like a separate database or anything like that. Yeah, it's in, it's in the applications database. Then we've got any updates regarding progressive web apps? What do you think the landscape future for prog progressive web apps? It looks great. I mean, just this year, uh, iOS finally got web push support. Mm -hmm. That's something we've been waiting for. And now you can have really use Safari on the desktop as well for storing those uh, progressive web apps in, in Mac. So, I, I mean, it's a... Uh, to me, it sounds like we were maybe moving a bit too early on the proxy web apps because uh, not all the all the promises were really. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of promise, but then the browsers had all kinds of limitations. It kind of took a bit of steam out of that. Yeah, out of that kind of a hopeful, nice future of having web apps everywhere, including mobile. Yeah. At the same time, I would say nowadays. People don't even talk about progressive web apps anymore. It's just kind of, well, it's a thing I have in the browser. I can install it on my home screen and, and that's it. So it's same, this, still the same thinking. It's just that the terminology has become redundant because it's it's taken for granted nowadays. Yeah. What else do we have over here? So SC asks, how would you how would the generated code be used? Could it be something for an end client could define or would it need compiling packaging deployment uh, i guess which... this refers to hilla hilla yeah so with, with hilla the code is generated at compile time because it, it goes into the same front end bundle as everything else and for production usage that's bundled minimized and processed to be as 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 small as possible for for the users to download so so it, it needs to happen at that time and it's kind of also for a developer experience when you write make a change in your data layer, hit save, uh, you should be able to use that change from the front end code immediately. And, and that's what we are doing right now. All right. Next question. We got a whole bunch of questions here. Oh, we, we got five of them above. Should we still have like seven minutes? We still have seven minutes, yeah, and, and a quick recap. So yeah, we can co continue answering questions. Uh, Thomas says that uh, they need more authentic authentication types in SSO kit, for instance, Google and or Firebase, uh, and also Grid, where selecting text would work better. Okay, so please, we, that's great. <laughs> yes, please file tickets, or yeah. maybe the tickets already exist. Just kind of put a thumbs up on them, uh, or email lay for me, and we'll make sure that our teams know those requirements. Yeah. Uh, for SSO kit, Google sign on is supported i mean it just uses the open id connect standard which just we haven't documented how to use it but that's something we actually were thinking of doing regardless Rene is saying that i would like to contribute to hilla uh, in which areas could i best support you or the moment oh, that's really nice to hear uh, yeah i would say the best thing right here today try out the latest snapshot version we have been working on the auto grid 
the autocrad feature and we really would want to get feedback how does it work for your case is it flexible enough and and how does it not work so that, yeah. that, that where are the gaps so that would be super useful and i mean uh if, when you see gaps and you file a ticket hey, this is broken feel free to put the pull request as well implement that it would be helpful for our team for sure but right now we're getting the crud really working it's it's uh the, the yeah. top priority for the team yeah i would say the second thing which is a little bit more independent is just take take any open bug in the bug tracker write a comment as kind of hey I, I, I think I, I could help out fixing this bug. Do you have any hints on, on how to proceed with it? And then we would be more than happy to, to, to do that. So as is asking about, is there any hardware integrations, more specifically NFC integration in the roadmap? No, there is not. Uh, so whatever is, is possible on the browser hardware, uh, it's super easy to use any browser APIs from Flow. So if it's possible to do on your browser, just go and use those browser APIs. There shouldn't need to be any, any extra integration. Yeah, but from what I remember, there isn't any browser API for NFC yet. There is yeah, for I'm... USB, there is for serial port stuff, but uh, USB, uh, Bluetooth, I mean, but I don't remember seeing anything for NFC. Could so, be. So, so before there is a browser API for it, we, we can't really do anything. Dominic is asking, does Varden Flow application act as your backend service at the same time? Is it good practice to integrate Varden Flow with your backend models uh, as a model, model of monolith architecture and let Varden Flow components use well defined interfaces? Um, yes. I, I mean, I, I like monoliths. <laughs> yeah, mo mo monoliths are, are good. Uh, so. Definitely, I mean, it, it's good to have a little bit of separation within the monolith still, kind of not do it as in the next JX example. To, yeah, not to everything in the same class. So. SQL in the quick listener, but, but kind of there's, from an architectural point of view, there's no need to have multiple layers there. If you have a kind of, you want to reuse that logic also for other things, then that might make sense as a microservice, but otherwise just keep it simple. I would say more strongly that if, if it's one team and one application, it's kind of a really stupid idea to introduce microservice in the middle. So basically <laughs> kind of make this simple high performance Java call to become a over the network call and basically encoding and decoding from JSON in there and have all kinds of problems with that approach. So, I mean, function calls are great. Yep. We got lots and lots of questions. It says that there's 11 questions about we won't have Maybe we're just going to wrap up this and then uh, where should we get, get back with these questions? Or should we just kind of wrap up and then we just kind of keep answering questions? People don't have to feel that they need to keep listening to get any more of the content. We have All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. So, yep. Um, so let's jump back to the presentation. So kind of quick recap. Uh, we are working on, on four areas, uh, kind of bringing Hill and, and Flow together make a super productive uh, framework that is fully and solely for Java developers, whether they want to write everything in Java or if they want to, want, if they want to leverage React in there as, as well. Uh, second thing is that we are really embracing the notion that Varn is a full stack framework. And it's kind of unique in, in that, that we are coupling together different layers and we want to have like the full uh, benefit out of that fact by making it uh, kind of leveraging that to making it easier for you to build applications. Uh, then we, on the UI editing side, we are working on two different things. We want to bring the drag and drop editing, whether that's themes or layouts, as well as AI inside your project in a way that you have always your code to be the master and then we'll help with drag and drop tools and AI for you to be more productive in, in building layouts and your user interfaces. So those are the themes that we are working on at the moment. And actually that might be a good time to ask the question as, as well. So yep, uh, where we have the poll. There we have the poll. And there we actually have it. 
So this is uh, basically a question. What do you think about these directions? Um, what are you most exciting of? This helps us to understand what is most important for you. Yeah, so is it combining React and, and uh, Java development? Is it improved developer experience with, with the tooling for editing things? Is it the full stack components or is it uh, AI integration to kind of help use the AI to make you more productive when you develop? No, maybe or maybe something is it, else. Is it something else? All right. Let's see what you guys think. Ah, oh. interesting. Yeah, people really like both the full stack components as well as improved uh, developer experience and tooling. Yep. Whereas then AI and mixing React and 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 well, mixing in React is well. There's still some people also liking that. And then we got some other questions. Do we even see those here? Not yet. We Not, will see this later on. Yeah, probably so. All right. That kind of, uh, I guess, almost concludes uh, what we had in, in mind. Uh, just want to kind of remind what we are all about uh, is, is making it easy to develop uh, business web apps in, in Java. Uh, and uh, so basically leveraging this, in, <laughs> leveraging this Java platform, making it easy for Java developers to build great web apps. And we are doing doing that by abstracting away from details, encapsulating things in components. So this is exact same thing that we started 20 years ago. And hopefully we are on, on that same journey 20 years from today. Yeah. So we, it's a job that is never done because it can always be even easier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, our contact info is over there. So feel free to send email to or to either of us or Tweet DMs are open as, as well. X, 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 X <laughs> I don't know. Uh, email maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had some questions. Let's go and, and take a look of those. So thank you for the guys who uh, participated this far, but are not hanging out in there for a couple of more questions. So where were we? Where were we? That one. Most of the customer requesting a web shop. It would be amazing if there would be template browser providing a Spring Boot plus Varn application for basically building a web shop. Uh, is there any work around that? Not at the moment. Uh, maybe some of those uh, areas could be interesting full stack components. But uh, frankly, at, we don't <coughs> have that many customers building web shops on top of Varn. It's more used for like a banking, insurance, healthcare, that type of sectors rather than front-facing uh, web stores. Yeah. Then uh, we got a question. Are you considering using ontologies to model specific business information systems since Varden is not, uh, is most valuable for this purpose? I'm currently writing a paper about it. So I was wondering if you had something similar. In general, we try to stay out of any specific business domain because that's that's where you are the experts and, and we are just, we, we, we would just be learning there. We, we really focus on kind of how do we combine web development and uh, or co combine web development with, with server side Java and, and that's our core expertise. Yeah, basically kind of providing tools for you to build on. Uh, one problem with AI writing code for you is that it will not know about the internal framework, for instance, it will not know if it should be used our own string util join. It will not know about the form uh, should be created with our data store form. That's totally correct. Uh, that's a limitation. So it's uh, uh, you should not expect that to write the whole application for you. It might be good for more limited cases. And what we expect it to be first limiting to quite specific use cases and over the time then expanding and expanding and expanding it while we learn what it can do and while the foundation models actually get better as well. Yep. Then we got a couple of thank you notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone was saying still excited about improving. Hey, hey, we should be reading all this. This is a great webinar. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, you can read them on your own. All right. <laughs> when you're feeling down. Yeah. Oh, we got the sun out here now also. Welcome back, Jonas. Yeah, great to be back. Thank you. Yes. And we got 
excited for improved quality and feature productivity with Wadi 8. So yeah, that's that's also something we've been working on, on a little bit. Any support to bundle native apps? Uh, no, not really. So yeah. I mean, if, if you mean like uh, for a mobile. Um... So some customers have been using Cordova phone gap, those technologies, but it's not something that we have uh, kind of built in support for at this moment. Yeah, one thing to note in there, somebody was asking about NFC support. So that's kind of one way to get around web limitations is to use Cordova and basically use that for uh, working with the NFC. Uh, it, it's a quite a hassle because then you have to actually distribute the actual app in the app stores. Yep. And actually, oh, final question. Uh, do you have links to read more about, oh, no, now we've got another question. <laughs> uh, do you have uh, links to read more about Reform and the AI tool? No, these are just uh, internal prototypes for now, but instead of just kind of discussing about the future vision, I think it's kind of better to, to be able to show some of that. And hopefully we are able to show some more of that, but not kind of announcing any timelines today yet. Yeah. But team is working full steam at the moment on, on those topics. Yes. And then a clarification to the previous question. So kind of about creating native apps, why not bundle them? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a trade-off distribution gets much more complicated since you need to go through the app store. The benefit is that you, you can use those native features like NFC and so on. Uh, at the same time, it's basically, it's one of those things that it's not that frequently requested. So we haven't prioritized it. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, we have been working with web for forever and we haven't been working that much with the native applications. So uh, it's, it's better to use tools for basically wrapping around the web built by guys who are experts on, on the native side of things. So yeah, what is just a web app? Yeah, just a web app. In there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. It was so awesome to have so many of you joining the webinar. Let's uh, meet soon as well in the in the next webinar. Yep. See you. See you.